Hello folks and welcome to the channel, welcome back to the channel. And this is the first video out of a series of three where we'll be looking at the Weber carburetor. And the Weber carburetor or the Delorto, which is quite similar, is kind of black magic to many of us. It's covered in a veil of mystery and it isn't because at the end of the day it is just a piece of aluminum, a chunk of aluminum with some channels in it and some jets. So in part number one, we're going to be looking at the details of that carburetor, how it works. In part number two, we'll take it apart, we'll clean it all up, and in part number three, we'll start tuning it. And we will be looking at the Weber carburetor, made in Italy, because there's also a Spanish one, they are very similar, of the type 40 DCOE, and that stands for Doppio Corpo Horizontale, and E stands for Standard. So what it means is side draft carburetor. And the 40 stands for the opening that we have on the carburetor towards the manifold. So what's the purpose of a carburetor? Well, the carburetor has to supply the proper air-fuel mixture, a 14 to 1 ratio typically, into the intake manifold of the engine. And it has to do that under all circumstances or all running conditions of the engine. It might have to do that under an idle condition, the engine is spinning idle. It may have to do that under an acceleration situation. It may have to do that under a cruising situation. And it may have to do this under a full open throttle situation. Or in very extreme cold situations where you have to get a cold start. And the carburetor has to be able to deal with all these different situations and deliver the right amount of fuel. Not too rich, not too lean. And how does it do that? Well, there's a very simple principle, and it's called the Venturi principle. Let me show you that. And I'm going to demonstrate it here with a pen, which is just a tube. The top of the pen, we consider that to be the nozzle, and then the water is our fuel. And the principle is as follows. If air flows over the top of the nozzle, it's going to create a local vacuum there, and that vacuum will suck up the fuel through the tube, and it will mix with the passing air. So let me try to show you that. I need to hold it a bit. I'm going to blow some compressed air over it, and you'll see it. You see that? And that's how it works. Very simple. Of course, this was a bit simplified because the carburetor has more jets inside than just one. Because we need to have the right jet for the right regime of the engine. We have the idle, we've got the acceleration, we've got the cruising, we've got the wide open throttle. So we have all that. And on top of that, the proper mixture is going to be determined by the nozzle or the jet opening, but also by the type of engine you have, the displacement of the engine. And these are all parameters that we need to consider once we start looking at proper jetting the carburetor. But for now, we forget this. This is going to be in part number three. Now we're going to focus on the carburetor itself, on all the different parts, where they are located and how they work. I will show you some diagrams, and it may become boring, but just skip that part if you don't like it. But it is not complicated, so stay tuned, because you might be interested in it. The carburetor is a dual carburetor, so you will see everything twice. You see twice the gas throttle. If I open up the gas throttle by depressing the gas pedal, this will open up. And now air can flow all the way straight through. Now we call it fully open. Now you might notice that there's a little number on there. Let me show you that number because that's important. On the throttle plates you will find an engraved number and this specific one is saying 79.30 degrees. That's the angle under which this gas throttle plate is sitting in the housing. Now over time the housing may get some more wear and tear so it might move a bit further. Uh, this is very important because it also relates to the progression holes we will talk about in a few seconds. So it might have to be that over time you may have to change this plate. This specific Weber has what we call a choke system on it. On many of them you will see this blanked off because you don't really need this if you're into racing or high performance cars. There's no need for that because you can squirt pure fuel directly into the intake manifold through the acceleration pump. And let me show you that. But in case you live in very cold areas you might want to use this. Let me take off the inspection cover on the carburetor and I will inject some fuel so I can demonstrate how you can actually squirt in fuel into the uh, intake manifold. Now why you don't need a choke. Cold starting the engine with a Weber carburetor without the choke system is not a big deal. All you need to do is push a few times the gas pedal 
and then you will see that fuel will be squirted directly into the intake manifold. Have a look over here, guys. See that? There's a common misunderstanding that a cold engine needs a far richer fuel mixture than a warm engine. And that is absolutely not true. It doesn't matter if the engine is cold or warm. What gets into the combustion chamber should have more or less the same composition, the same ratio, air to fuel ratio. What is true though is that when the engine is cold, the intake manifold and the block and the carburetors, everything else is fairly cold at that moment in time. And that the mixture that's inside the carburetor, air and fuel, is getting thinner or leaner on its way down into the combustion chamber because you have losses. And that is why we need to enrich on a cold engine the mixture inside the carburetor because we have a loss on its way down. So the first circuitry we're going to look at is the idle circuitry. And in the front of the Weber carburetor, close to the intake manifold, you will find this idle mixture adjustment screw. And typically half a turn to a turn and a half is the correct setting for a proper mixture. Now obviously this screw alone is not going to do the adjustment for the correct mixture for your carbon dioxide. Inside the well you have the idle jet and we'll have a look on the idle jet in a few seconds. So the idle jet combined with the idle mixture screw will give you the right mixture. Now these screws they come in different types. I think there are two models of them and mine is the uh, fairly sharp one. You have one which is a bit more blunt and they are very sensitive. Here is that screw. Um, so let me show you where that leads into. When the engine is idling, the gas throttle is fully closed. So in other words, the engine can't get any fuel mixture through the main jet. And that's why there is a very little hole there. You see that just below my pen. And that is where the idle screw, mixture screw, fits in. That's where the fuel is going to pop out right into the cylinder. So let me show you where the idle jet is located. For that, you need to remove the jet inspection cover. And here you have the idle jets. One on the left and there's one on the right. So let's take the idle jet out. This is the idle jet and on the top you actually have the opening and this specific jet is a 50 F8 and you will have to tune and match this depending on your engine type, depending on the volume and you may have to fit different types. I will come back to all these numbers later but not right now, that will be part of the tuning aspect and the rebuild. So we now have looked at the idle circuitry of that carburetor. We've seen the fuel mixture adjustment screw, which is all the way in the front, and we looked at the idle jet opening, and they come in different types, and there's a number stamped on it. Now it's time to see on how we get from idle to acceleration, because the gas throttle is closed, so somehow we have to get over that point whereby we don't have enough fuel in idle to accelerate or to pick up speed on the engine. So that's why we now are gonna shift between an idle condition and a actual running condition. And that's what we call progress, right? We're progressing from idle to running. And that progress is arranged by progress holes. Sounds weird, but the progress holes are little holes that are drilled into the actual carburetor and they are feeding fuel over the same circuitry as the idle circuitry, additional holes, so a bigger opening. And it's important that these holes are being uncovered at the right position of the gas throttle. So let's have a close look on that. And just behind the idle mixture screw, you will find the screw that covers up the progression holes. So let me open that up for you so you can have a better look. And inside, you see the three progression holes. So I'm going to place a light in the front of the carburetor where the intake manifold is and pay close attention to the progression holes. While I'm depressing the gas throttle, slowly you will see them opening up little bit by little bit as light is coming in. Now, while three are open, 
now my gas throttle is already partially open now and if I push it a little bit further now I'm gonna have help from the main jet which will start to work as long as the airflow is sufficient but in that very initial phase I needed help from the progression holes to get that engine going because the idle jet isn't enough when the engine is idle the progression holes should not be visible just like now as soon as I open up the gas throttle a bit they will become visible and now we're in the progression state and now we can start to accelerate and we can adjust the position of the throttle with this screw so that the progression holes are not uncovered under idle circumstances so so far we looked at the engine in idle condition we have seen on how we can adjust the throttle so that the progression holes don't get exposed under idle we also have seen on how we advance from idle to a running condition whereby we slowly and progressively open up the progression holes and now it's time to look at an acceleration situation because some moment in time we want to floor that paddle and then accelerate so let's have a look on what circuitry we have on the Weber carburetor for acceleration. Acceleration requires additional fuel to be injected into the intake manifold or into the cylinders. And we cannot rely on the Venturi system for that because that's a bit too slow. That's why we have an acceleration pump. And then watch how it's going to squirt. And in fact, I showed it to you already uh, what you could do for a cold start. But have a look. See that squirt? That's the acceleration pump, which is doing a one-time squirt of fuel directly into the intake manifold. And I'm sure we all have experienced the issue with our car that if you floor the pedal, the car is hesitant to pick up. It's kind of like, <clears throat> and then it goes. And that is exactly because your acceleration pump is not working properly. It's not squirting at the right time or it's not squirting at all. And the acceleration jet is just behind the progression screw. So let's take it off and have a closer look. And there it is. This is your acceleration jet. Now the jet by itself is not sufficient because you're going to need an acceleration pump which is underneath this cover. And that's where the acceleration pump is. So if I open up the throttle, you will see the acceleration pump going down. We looked on the acceleration jet and we looked at the acceleration pump at the plunger more specifically but there are many more parts involved on the acceleration pump like little valves that prevent fuel from going back into the fuel cup where all the fuel is contained with the float. At the bottom of the carburetor fuel cup you will find the anti return valve for the acceleration pump. So we looked at the acceleration jet we looked at the acceleration pump and now we know that this is injecting pure fuel into the intake manifold one time once you floor that pedal so you want to accelerate very fast and this is done to overcome the dead moment before the main jet can start doing its job so now it's time for something serious it is the main jet and the emulsion tube now that sounds complex and in fact it is a bit complex now if you're driving the vehicle the gas throttle will be open in a certain position and you're going to need sufficient fuel now the amount of fuel that you're going to need is going to depend on many things how many rpms you're doing uh, how wide is the gas throttle open all these things will have an effect on it so therefore the main jet has to adapt to that we need a dynamic adjustable fuel mixture depending on the need at that moment in time and therefore we have what we call a emulsion tube it is actually a tube where on the bottom you have your main jet and on the top you have your air compensation jet and in that tube fuel and air will vary and now the level of the fuel in the carburetor cup is now becoming very critical and important but we'll talk about this after this and then out of that tube in the middle you have some bleeding holes and these bleeding holes will then feed the auxiliary or the secondary venturi so let's have a look at that. The main fuel set is responsible for fueling the secondary venturi. This is that tube that you see coming there right in the middle. And that fuel there is regulated through the emulsion tube that I just mentioned. So now let's have a look on that emulsion tube and see on how that works. 
I have removed the top of the carburetor and on the right hand side you find a emulsion tube and on the left hand side you have the other emulsion tube for the second part of the carburetor. So let's open it up and have a look at what that is. And here it is, the emulsion tube. And here you have the emulsion tube. It's now facing upside down, otherwise it falls over. But on the top now you have the actual main jet, then you have the emulsion tube, and then you have inside here you have the air compensation jet. So let's have a closer look, first of all now, on the main jet. And this is the main jet, and it has actually a number on it, and we'll have a closer look in a second. So here we still have the emulsion tube, but I took the top part off. And on the top you have your air compensation jet. And I think it says 175, so they come in different numbers, and that's also important that all this is matched up, but we'll talk about this during the jetting of that carburetor. Air will be coming in to the top of the emulsion tube and that's why we have a certain size of an air jet, an air compensation jet and on the bottom we have the fuel jet and the fuel comes up, air comes together and it will leak out right in the middle here through these holes to the main or the secondary venturi. Now the emulsion tube itself also has a number and I think this is an F16 uh, they come in different types of models. They are, we have conversion tables for that, and we'll talk about it later. And the main jet also has a number on it, and I think this is a 165, so all that needs to be tuned together. So we looked at the emulsion tube, and that has three main components. It has the main jet, which has a specific number. It has an emulsion tube number itself and then you have the air compensation jet which is also having a specific number now all this needs to be matched up to your specific driving conditions to your specific car uh, to your specific carburetor and now for that you have tables uh, on Weber manuals but we'll go through this because I'm going to tune this up for this engine I'm not sure what I have in this carburetor is correct but we'll double check on that so now it's time for something even more critical uh, the emulsion tube can only work properly if the fuel level in the carburetor cup is correct. So let's look on that and see how that level is maintained. Fuel has been pumped in by the fuel pump into the carburetor. And by the way, uh, the carburetor does not need more than 1.5 to 2.5 psi, but it needs high volume. Once the fuel gets in, it gets through a little filter which is underneath this nut, and then it's going to fill up the fuel chamber in the carburetor to a certain level. So I'm going to take the cover off so we can see what's blocking or stopping the filling of the carburetor. And you will see that very quickly. There is what we call a float. This is the float and that is controlling a valve which is right there. The fill level of the fuel chamber in the carburetor is determined by the adjustment of this float. So if the chamber is empty, then the float is all the way to the bottom. And once fuel starts filling up, the float will start to float upwards and it will close the valve. And at a certain level, depending on the valve adjustment or the float adjustment, no more fuel can get in. Now that level is critical for the emulsion tube to work properly. Uh, this is the fuel valve that will stop fuel coming in, depending on the lip of this float, pushing it down or not. And that's what needs to be calibrated or adjusted. So we're nearing the end of this video. We have looked at the different circuits that are making up a Weber carburetor. We looked at the idle circuitry, we looked at the progression circuitry, we looked at the acceleration circuitry, we looked at the main jet, and we looked a little bit about the choke, but not a lot on that. And now you know more or less how that works. Um, I can't tell you right now what kind of settings you have to use and how you need to adjust everything right now because that will be in part number three where I'm going to tune my specific carburetor for my specific engine. Now, referring back to all the different numbers of the jets, you can find this typically in the Weber catalogs and the Weber books because they will describe that for you as a basic guideline, a starting point to tune your carburetor. It's not the final tuning. You really will have to tune it on a dynamo, but I don't have one, uh, so I will have to do a road test. But this is in part number three. In part number two, we're going to clean up the whole carburetor, take it completely apart, and we're going to be using a overhaul kit 
to bring it back to good working conditions because this didn't work too well on this current engine that I have right now. So I hope you enjoyed it and please by all means make comments. Uh, I know I haven't given you all the little details, there's a lot more to it, but right now I think you're in a position to understand how the Weber is really working. So thank you for viewing and I'll see you in my next video. Bye-bye.